Welcome to the Red Clear Politics Takeaway for Friday, February 12th. I'm Andrew Walworth. Today's headline, the prosecution rests. As last night, House Democrats wrapped up their impeachment case against President Trump, who stands accused of inciting the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. How did the Democrats do and how will Team Trump respond? And while it is hard to keep up with what is and is not acceptable in woke America, we'll check in on the fortunes of rocker Bruce Springsteen, actress Gina Carano, and rising country star Morgan Wallen, each of whom is in the middle of a controversy. And in COVID-related news, we'll talk about Governor Cuomo and recent revelations about a possible cover-up. Joining me to discuss all this are Tom Babin, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics, Carl Cannon, Washington Bureau Chief, and Molly Hemingway, Senior Editor of The Federalist. So, Tom, the Democrats have had three days to make their arguments. Uh, They need 17 Republican senators to reach a conviction. But let's get right into it. How did they do and what do you think happens next? Well, I think we all know the outcome and we've known what the outcome was going to be for a long time. I don't think a lot of minds were changed by the presentation by the House managers. My thinking on all this stuff usually is, you know, they could have made these arguments in 30 minutes, right? Trump's lawyer could have made his argument in five minutes. Instead, he spent 30 minutes talking about a God knows what. It's just kind of ridiculous. So I think they I think they sort of went on a little bit long, but I think the House managers did a, a very effective job in, in presenting their case, but I don't think it matters in the end. I, I think this was all pre-decided, and um, uh, so I think we, we knew the outcome before any of this actually happened. But Molly, this is... Everyone knows this, that this is a political uh, event, not a legal event. And it's strange that we call them jurors and, you know, making their case and all this stuff. But it really has nothing to do with a court of law. On a political level, uh, how effective do you think the Democrats were? I think that the first impeachment was remarkably ineffective, so ineffective that by, you know, a few months later when there were conventions being held, the Democrats didn't even mention that they'd held an impeachment trial for President Trump. But somehow this second impeachment, like, doesn't even come close to that standard, this impeachment trial. I noticed that the viewership was extremely low for something, particularly that people don't have a lot of other things going on, so they would have time to be watching it. So I think the political impact is low. I think that the approach that Democrats were using, this isn't about actually caring about speech or else this would be like our hundredth impeachment trial of a public officer in the last few years. I think it was about helping Democrats stick together, helping them have something they all share. And one of the few things that they all share is a deep and abiding hatred of Donald Trump. So this was a good thing for that. And then also to see if they could separate the Republican Party from her voters. And so they're just trying to see who can they peel off in the House? Who can they peel off in the Senate, knowing that that will demoralize Republican voters and remind them of how much they dislike their leadership? That was not very effective either. I mean, even in the heat, like the dramatic heat of the moment, even with Liz Cheney involved, they could only get 10 House members to do that. And then in the Senate, you have like a maximum of six Republicans that will vote for conviction because the rest don't even view the trial itself as constitutional. Well, Carl, you wrote a piece on this this week and came down pretty hard on the president. How do you think the Republicans will respond? I think the Democrats have made a, a good case, a solid case. If I were a Republican senator, I would be weighing this. Uh, I'm not and probably couldn't get elected as a Republican senator in any state, uh, maybe Alaska. I don't know. That's a race I would like to see. Carl in Alaska. I'll run that race for you. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. But but here's here's the thing. You could think that this was unconstitutional. And I I think that most of the Republicans, the, the, the Senate Republicans, look, that's an easy out for them to say that. But I don't doubt their sincerity. I think probably most of them believe that. But that question has now been addressed and answered. That's a majority vote question. Uh, You know, I said this last week before this trial started. You said they're not jurors. It's interesting, Andy, because, you know, they wouldn't be allowed to be a jury if this was jury pool because they all have opinions for and against Trump. But under the system that we have that the founding fathers set up, they're the judge and the jury. And whether it was constitutional or not is a decision it's a question if this were a trial, a matter of law. And the judge, the Senate, 
Senate Democrats with six Republicans ruled that it is constitutional. So now you have the second phase of this, and it's they're now the trier of fact. Now they're the jurors. And I think the Democrats, the House impeachment managers made a strong case that A, Donald Trump never accepted the results of this election. And everybody in that chamber knows you can't have electoral democracy if people will run for office and won't accept if they lose. And B, that he encouraged people to... The, he, he whipped up the frenzy of this mob, maybe not directly, but cer- they said directly, but maybe indirectly. I thought they made a pretty strong case. Tom and Molly both think it was all for nothing because they, they, these Republicans weren't going to vote to do this to Donald Trump. On the Democrat side, though, there's a question. If, if their motivation is partly political, I think they're also, they were appalled and frightened. Would him, convicting Trump actually hurt the Republicans more? I, I don't know that it would. Trump has an odd ability to take strength from things like this. I think if they impeached him again, I think he would, you know, run his son for president or or do something they do in third world countries. I don't know, maybe form a third party. I don't know. I don't Carl, know that isn't, he would just accept isn't this, this what is done in third world countries, like putting troops in a capital and running your like putting your previous uh, president through a show trial that feels very third world to me, and I don't even necessarily disagree that that there should be some kind of censure for for how he behaved. But if it's true that this is a threat to democracy to not accept election results, there are literally hundreds of Democrats who didn't accept the 2016 election and still haven't, and caused all sorts of problems. And I just think it's like if you're gonna. If you're going to have that standard, you have to have that standard and you have to demonstrate that you have that standard by having the previous few hundred people who didn't accept the 2016 election have some level of accountability instead of the none that they had, like literally none, no censure, no removal from committees, no uh, impeachment, no conviction. There's been no accountability for what they put the country through because I think they think they were legitimate in in doing what they did. And Likewise, I think Republicans think they're legitimate in questioning the 2020 election. They think it was sloppy. They have a pretty good case that this level of mail-in balloting without scrutiny was damaging to the republic. And I'm not defending refusal to accept election results. I agree that it's wrong, but you have to have a consistent standard and you can't just deploy it on one side legally, militarily, politically. That is going to completely destroy the republic. I don't disagree with what Molly said. I think it's important, actually, to make this point. What happened on January 6th was appalling and frightening and destabilizing to the country. But it wasn't just out of left field. It didn't just come by magic. It was an escalation of what's already been going on in this country for years. Buildings being vandalized, buildings being destroyed. One of the House impeachment managers said Zachary Taylor's statue was splattered in blood. They've been tearing down statues of Zachary Taylor and other people and Lincoln all over the country. And you couldn't get these Democrats to say a word about it. This was a terrible thing. But it, but Molly's right. It was an escalation of what's already been going on. And the Democrats didn't want to talk about it until now. That's a problem. Well, Tom, let's just look forward. What do you think the next move is for the Republicans? They're due to make a response. This could wrap up by the weekend, couldn't it? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's going to go fast. And again, I think the vote's already predetermined. Trump's not going to be convicted. And I think Molly's right. I mean, listen, I tweeted this the other day. I mean, the Democrats, it never made sense to me to go forward with this thing other than for political reasons and just sort of an irrational hatred of Trump. Imagine how they could have put forth a censure that would have passed the House and the Senate while he was still in office, and they could have gotten Republicans on board. It would have been a a real, as I termed it, a bipartisan kick in the ass on his way out the door. And But that's not what the Democrats chose to do. That's because they wanted to, quite frankly, uh, continue to humiliate him on behalf of their base, because that's what they've been about, but also to try and <laughs> prevent him from running for, running for office, which isn't going to happen. I think it was a mistake to move forward with impeachment because it wasn't going to go anywhere. And as a result, it divided the country further when they actually could have gotten some bipartisan agreement on the fact that what Trump did was he crossed a line. It was beyond the pale. It shouldn't have happened. He And, and he should have been uh, condemned for it, as, as most Republicans condemned what happened on January 6th. So this is going to be over in short order. And then I think the Democrats and the media, quite frankly, who have been, you know, I'm going to 
all these websites every single morning, CNN, I mean, they are literally, I don't know how they're going to fill their their airtime and their pages without Donald Trump because it's all that they can seem to talk about to the exclusion of all these other stories, which hopefully we're going to talk about in a minute, that are also pretty significant. Let's move on. I have to say, I, I, I know we had to talk about impeachment. I'm glad we got it out of the way because what I really wanted to talk about today was the boss. Both Carl and Molly wrote about the now infamous Super Bowl Jeep ad. I was a little afraid the story would be too old for today's podcast, but the news gods were with me this week. Bruce and Jeep both managed to make news this week to keep the story going. So Carl, just bring us up to date and tell me if you stand by your column, which is on RCP, as is Molly's, two different views of this Jeep ad. Um, do you still think Bruce is the right person for this message of unity that we all embrace at some level, I suppose? Andy, are you implying that this utterly horseshit arrest by a ze- overzealous park <laughs> ranger should make me change my view that Bruce Springsteen was the perfect messenger for re- re- for reuniting America? Because... I, I'm surprised you would even ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> Carl's going to say drinking and driving is as, as American as apple pie. It's less dangerous, I think, according to Nitsa, than texting and driving. But Bruce Springsteen was riding a motorcycle. He was parked. He had a shot at tequila. His fans pulled him over. Uh, I think it was tequila. Was it Padron? Did, nice. Is that right? And then... And then some overzealous flat foot made him do a sobriety test. He told him to walk 18 steps. Bruce was so surprised because he was so sober, he walked 45, (laughs) which the cop then used against him as though he can't count. I assume this is going to get thrown out. So, But let's stick to this. Yet another argument to defund the police, Carl. (laughs) Yeah, I actually, I'm putting that on my Jeep. I'm going to have a bumper sticker on my Jeep pickup truck that says defund the police, which will be cognitive dissonance <laughs> to most people. Anyway, but let's, well, let's let Molly explain why she thought that this ad, the Super Bowl ad, wasn't the right tone, right? That And Bruce wasn't well, the Well, let right me guy. first say that I watched the Super Bowl. I stopped watching football many years ago when the Broncos lost to the Seahawks like seven or eight years ago. I don't even remember. Amen. Not because I, not because of any like high moral reason or anything. I just was so crushed by the Broncos loss. And I'd put so much into being their fan that I was like Frederick Exley style, realizing I couldn't be that level of fan anymore. So this is only the second football game I've watched in a really long time. I was so annoyed by nearly all of the commercials, either for quality reasons or for social justice reasons. So I was just in a bad mood about the commercials to begin with. And the Jeep one did send me over the edge. (laughs) I don't share Carl's love of Bruce Springsteen. I don't hate him. I just, I recognize he has a certain fan base. I'm not in it. I've seen him live. I will admit that that was an amazing performance when I saw him live. But he is a partisan leftist Democrat who said really horrible things about Reagan and Bush and Bush and Trump. And it's fine that he has those views. It just makes him a bad person person to talk about the importance of unity. I think there are maybe hundreds of millions of other people who might be better suited than he is. The imagery I also found just offensive. The like it was just a very cold and dark ad. I didn't like the exploitation of a church. You know, you have on the one hand the political left saying such horrible things about Christian churches or whatnot. And then using it just felt a little bit like pandering. The whole message of unity doesn't work when you have spent four years saying that there is nothing to be given to Republicans in any way and to then turn on a dime and then say you have to be unified. It just sort of matches a Biden administration talking point that doesn't resonate with a lot of Americans. So, Tom, you know, Chrysler pulled the ad. This ad cost millions. Paused. And- they paused it, Andy. They said they pa- they said they paused oh, it. OK, they paused the ad. But, yeah. But you can still find it on Bruce's Instagram account if you want well, to see if you're, it. Well, if you're one of the five people in America who haven't seen this ad, I guess you can see it on Instagram. But, but they pulled the ad uh, or paused the ad. Thank you, Carl. I guess they're claiming that they, they paused it because of this drunk driving allegation that might get thrown out, as Carl says. But do you think there's more to it than that? Do you think that, that the blowback on this was just something that Jeep thought maybe was not, not a good idea? I don't know. It's tough to, tough to say. You know, I mean, I did look the ad ran. 
these kind of ads only need to run once, and and they've generated enough commentary. I mean, if it never runs again, people will still know. It's not like they're going to be saturating the airwaves with it. So, uh, you know, I don't know if this was a if Bruce got canceled. I doubt it. There were plenty of people who loved that ad, including Carl, who thought it was thought it was a great message. So, I mean, I'm I'm more in the camp with Molly. I didn't watch it during the Super Bowl um, because. We were behind, you know, we had DVR'd the game, so we fast-forwarded through the commercials, and we were going to go back and watch them later. I got up and watched it the next morning, and, you know, it, it didn't really do much for me uh, in terms of, in terms of you know, the, the message of unity. Um, and I think Molly's probably right that Bruce was maybe not the right spokesperson for that. But, but again, Carl and plenty of other people thought that he was, so that's fine. Tom didn't watch the game live because his quest to get wings for his family had a lot more drama than the game itself. <laughs> my, this is a. <laughs> it was a terrible a, game. Well, so my. I loved the game. But, uh, but Tom, you know, we do have two other people who were in the crosshairs of the cancel culture this week. And Gina Carano was fired by the producers of Mandalorian for some tweets. And rising country star Morgan Wallen. He's not rising anymore. Uh, he was caught on video using the N-word by his neighbor's doorbell camera after a 72-hour bender. What's going on? I'll let Molly speak to the uh, Gina Carano story because I know she's tweeted about that and commented on it. My kids have watched The Mandalorian, but I have not watched it. I was not even aware of her in that, and I, I sort of brought myself up to speed on it. But the Morgan Wallen thing, you know, is rarely have we seen a career that has been as as meteoric in its rise and its fall. He comes home, he's been out all night, and he's sort of horsing around as they get out of an Uber or whatever, and uses the N-word. Bad, bad move, right? But... This speaks to the whole, how much does intent matter, right? The New York Times fired Don McNeil and said, you know, intent doesn't matter at all. You use that word, you're done. Now, they've since, they've since realized that that's an untenable position. And so, you know, I look at Morgan Wallen and I think, anytime you use the M-word, you're going to be in trouble, okay? You just are, unless you're black, of course. But if you're, if you're a white person, you can't even say it in any context without having some sort of repercussion, Right. Well, wait. There's the Quentin Tarantino well, okay, codicil. Fine, but yeah, that was uh, that was in a different era. <laughs> Reservoir Dogs was a long time ago, Carl. Um, but no. But the point being, I was thinking of pulp. I was thinking of know, pulp fiction. So he made a bad mistake. He was not saying it at an individual. He was not using it with malicious intent. And so the question is, does he deserve to have his entire career, which again was he was sort of on this meteoric rise to be. St- stripped away from him. I mean, within 24 hours, Country Music Association had released a statement. They'd taken him off the radio. It was like he became, he went from being this this rising star to just persona non grata overnight. And so, and I, I don't think that's the kind of culture that we want to live in, where there's no, there's no grace, there's no forgiveness, there are no second chances. Now, if he had stood there and said that at an individual with malicious intent, that would be a different story. I mean, that would say something about who he is, his character, all of that. So, so that that story, the Morgan Wallen story, I think bothered me in the way that he was just sort of summarily dismissed for, uh, admittedly, a, a, a bad. You know, he apologized. I mean, he was remorseful about it. But in this day and age, that doesn't even seem to matter at all either, and that uh, that disturbs me. Molly, what do you think? I am so sick to death of all cancel culture. Uh, just in general, this idea that all private moments are up for cancellation. I don't care who you are. I just don't. It just seems kind of un-American and very dangerous to the fabric of the Republic. And in Gina Carano's case, she was fired for warning. <laughs> she said that in Nazi Germany, like sort of the camps were the last part. But before that, it was neighbors turning against neighbors and that we should think about that, which is a good thing to say, not a bad thing to say and something that everybody should think about making sure they're not dehumanizing their political opponents because it does lead to camps. And then they fired her and claimed that she was anti-Semitic or something like that, which is just so dystopic, like you don't want this to be the reality. But in general, we have crazy far left views in Hollywood that conservatives have tolerated for decades. And people on the left seem unable to tolerate, like even slightly non leftist views among their stars. It is 
not healthy. It's just it just it's like the things you would read about in Russia. <laughs> now it's happening here. I think there's a reason why so many people who are American who came from communist countries are particularly alarmed by this totalitarianism and authoritarianism in these really important institutions like our media, academia, uh, the tech industry is now controlling speech in ways that are that are deeply un-American and they're clearly the most powerful people in the country. And if they can do that to high profile people, if they can deplatform the president, the sitting president of the United States or a Hollywood star, everyone else understands what that means. It mean, I mean, it's terrifying to people who don't have power and voice and money. They know that people want them dead or silenced or, you know, both. And it is horrible. And it's it's going to have political ramifications and bad times ahead. Carl, what do you make of this? Well, I, I, I keep thinking we've reached rock bottom, but apparently we haven't yet. Um, this uh, Gina Carano thing, I agree with everything Molly said about it. She's she's warning that Republicans are being treated like the other, like like Jews in Germany and people like that. And so so a couple of things about that. First of all, they fired her and said, well, you can't you can't even bring up the Holocaust. This is after five years of thousands, thousands, thousands of Democrats comparing Trump to Hitler it, and 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 bringing up Nazi Germany over and over it, and over and over. Again including, by the way, if floor. I could just interject, Gina Carano's co-star in The Mandalorian, who tweeted in 2018 or 2019 uh, a picture, you know, when when the kids we had the border crisis, right? Kids in cages, and you know, an analogy to to the Holocaust himself. So, yeah, no, that's right. And so, w- by firing her, they proved her point. That that's the thing. And I, I don't. Are they too stupid to get that? I don't really understand. The and, and you know, this is this is going around in our culture. There was a letter to dear Amy, uh, who did she take over for dear Abby or Ann Landers? I can't remember. But dear Amy, she's the syndicated columnist yep. from Chicago, right, Tom? And the question was, I saw a picture of my neighbor in the Capitol uh, on January 6th. Should I turn him into the cops? Dear Amy didn't even weigh it, man. Oh, yeah, of course you should. You know, and this is this is not this is what ha- there was an earlier case a month ago of a woman of a young teenager t- turned in her mother and she was lionized by the by the you know, MSNBC and CNN sites like that. And this is this is what happened in Nazi Germany. It's what happened in the Soviet Union. It's what happens in totalitarian governments. Turn in your friends, your neighbors, sp- spy on them, turn in your family members for the for the cause, for the cause of the government. And it is it is frightening. It's Orwellian. And when you add the doorbell camera, th- that's supposedly supposed to prevent you from being burglarized. It is literally Orwellian. We've gone past what George Orwell thought we could do because he didn't ha- he didn't really get our technology and you'd think liberals w- would know this you'd think the aclu would understand this you'd think democrats who'd been around long enough you'd think dean Becquet would know this you'd think the people who came out of liberal the liberal left li- liberal wing of the democratic party like my parents did that's the household i was raised in you'd think these people would get the danger here and instead they're just they're either per- perpetuating themselves or most often just deferring to young, the, the young people on their staff and in their companies, and and it's it's obviously dangerous, and it's not. And, and Molly said it is literally un-American. Dean Bacay is the uh, uh, editor of the New York Times, but Tom, I want to talk about one more thing, which is this Cuomo story. Uh, his aide, Melissa De Rosa, New York Post has uh, the recording that she admits they were hiding the nursing home data. Uh, so the federal authorities wouldn't find out what it exactly had happened with COVID patients up there in New York. This sort of just broke. Um, is this going to be a big story? And uh, how damaging for uh, Governor Cuomo do you think it is? Well, it, it, it should be a big story. I mean, you have on tape one of the governor's aides admitting that they covered up thousands of nursing home deaths for political reasons because they didn't – because. You know, Trump was tweeting about him and they didn't want to put Democrats in a bad position. It's first of all, we've known that Cuomo was responsible for thousands of deaths. Right. He signed this order that put covid patients back in nursing homes. Um, And I mean, the most infuriating thing about this is that he's not only has he gotten a pass from the media, he's been he's been boosted by the media 
at every turn uh, from his brother on CNN. You know, he writes a book about COVID leadership uh, based on his, you know, his press conferences. He wins a daytime Emmy. I mean, it is absurd that this guy is treated as the sort of paragon of, of you know, COVID virtue and leadership. Um, meanwhile, you know, Ron DeSantis is down there literally taking on everybody uh, and being billed as the worst governor in America for, for his handling of COVID. So I hope this is a big story. I hope there are consequences from it. There, there needs to be accountability. I do think that the media is, who has been, as I said, in many ways complicit in this. Um, I, I don't expect that they're going to uh, turn on uh, Governor Cuomo, certainly not in the way that they're turning on the Lincoln Project, for example, uh, <laughs> and start you know digging deep into what 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 happened here. Wait a minute, let me let me interject there because I don't think that's entirely fair to the press. <laughs> uh, C- CNN two weeks ago, Brianna Keeler uh, of CNN did this. She raked him over the coals, and she they had a a report that lasted some some a lengthy report that showed all of his lies, Cuomo's, played the tape of what he said and then played the and then exposed the facts. I, so wait so a minute, one, 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 one report on ta- CNN time, two at, weeks ago is, is at the sufficient? Time, at the, well, you said they wouldn't dig into it. I think they already are. At the time, when he was doing these, these goofy briefings and getting these rave reviews from people drooling on themselves, that was pretty bad. But it's clear, it's been clear for some time since his book came out, which he bragged about curing COVID in New York. Um, it, it's been clear that he has trouble telling the truth about this story. And I think the press is onto this guy. And I, 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 I expect we're going to get more coverage, not less. Yeah, to show that there can be like two sides here. Uh, Carl thinks Tom was too tough on the press, and I think he was way too kind on the press <laughs> as it comes to Cuomo. So, yes, I'm glad to hear there was a single segment on CNN that lightly dug into something. But the amount that they have to make up for month after month after month of like jokey fun time between the Cuomo brothers while men and women are dying in nursing homes, I, it's, a, it's a lot to make up. And this is one example of so many stories that actually, if you're if you're right of center or not like solely reading left wing news like The New York Times, you actually knew this was going on for months. Now, finally, very belatedly, after giving awards and, you know, celebrating at their convention. Now they're like, oh, it turns out, I guess he killed a bunch of people. Um, and now it's supposed to be legitimate now that these left wing outlets are, are picking it up. That is not a good uh, news ecosystem that we're in. There are so many stories like that that deal with coronavirus or deal with, you know, the Lincoln Project, you know, it, less important things like that, where right of center media or just non leftist media is hitting a story months or even years before left wing media outlets do it. And you can't just pretend like once they pick it up, then it's legitimate. Um, but I'm glad, yes, that finally people are starting to recognize this. But I'm worried that given the media that we have and the uh, elite establishments we have, that Cuomo is still going to win more Emmys. He's still going to uh, get more awards and that he's going to get away with this. And that is, you know, deeply problematic. This idea that we celebrate Gavin Newsom and we celebrate uh, Cuomo and we denigrate people who balanced the benefits and costs of shutdowns and other measures. Uh, that was, you know, thinking these are these are real people's lives that are impacted by failure to process this pandemic properly and have good policy reactions. And the media are firmly, you know, left wing media in particular, firmly on the bad side of things here. What a tough crowd, Andy. You kill a few <laughs> thousand people and you have to return an Emmy. <laughs> well, and one of the byproducts of this is that Janice Dean is going to be the new governor of New York. So that's something. Well, I what, did want to ask just, uh, uh, and Molly, I'll start with you, just looking at the governors uh, today, um, it's always fun to sort of look forward a little bit. And, you know, which which governors do you think are sort of poised to uh, to become national figures between now and, and 2024? So I haven't thought a lot on the Democrat side of things yet. The Republican side, I think what people, what voters are looking for are people who are good on policy issues, whether it's you know, strong but restrained foreign policy, um, an economic policy that is focused on the benefits to the middle class, and ability to fight some of these cultural issues against the media. So that puts Ron DeSantis like straight to the top 
you know, on a rocket ship. I think also Christy Nome is someone who has shown real leadership during this time as well. So those would be my top two. Carl? Well, I, you know, you can't, we're talking about 2024. To show you how quickly things change, a year ago, uh, 11, actually 10 months ago, 10 or 11 months ago, um, Kamala Harris' career as a national politician seemed over. She had gotten this tremendous launch. The press had fawned over her in a way that you don't often see. She'd raised all this money. She she attracted so little support, even in the African American and Asian community, that she couldn't even get to the starting line of the of the presidential race. She had to quit. It was an embarrassing flop. Gavin Newsom was being hailed as the as the as the great next hope for the Democratic Party. Uh, fast forward, Gavin Newsom is now going to fight a recall effort against him because of a one perfectly legal dinner at the French Laundry in Napa, and Kamala Harris is vice president. So it shows you how quickly fortunes can change. The governors that seem to have handled this well, uh, yeah, I I think Ron DeSantis, he's gotten this terrible press, but what you know, I have a a friend of mine who lives in Florida who's exactly my age. Uh, we share we're grandfather of the same child. So he's my daughter-in-law's dad. Um, his name is Jose Maranzini. He's gotten his vaccine already. I, I can't even get an appointment. He had his vaccine a month ago. So, you know, Florida has handled the vac- vac- vaccination. I, you know, nobody in the Republican Party is ever going to look to West Virginia, but their governors handle it very well. Um, you know, our governor in Virginia has, um, I, I don't have words for how poorly our states handled it. So this this crisis brought forth some people who knew how to lead and it exposed others who had good reputations uh, who don't know how to lead. Tom, last word. Who, who do you like for 2024 among the governors? If you will allow me to quote myself, I tweeted the other day. <laughs> so Ron DeSantis was, was chastised by someone for not wearing a mask at the Super Bowl. And he basically told him to shove it. He said, you know, how in the hell am I supposed to drink a beer and watch my team win? <clears throat> um, and I tweeted, first he kicks social media in the nuts. Now he's defending his God-given right to drink beer at the Super Bowl. If he keeps this up, he's going to be a juggernaut in 2024. I think Ron DeSantis has <laughs> not only uh, on policy, and again, remember how he won his race in the first place over Andrew Gillum when everybody thought, including the pollsters, that, that he was going to lose that race. Not only won it, uh, surprisingly, but subsequently had, you know, this, this, uh, he was, you know, huge approval ratings, highest approval rating of any governor in Florida in the last 40 years because of the way that he came into office. And, and so I think that bodes well for him in a situation where, to Molly's point, it'll be about policy, but it'll also be about, you know, sort of being an, an everyman and having that sensibility, which he seems to really have. He speaks pretty plainly. Um, he's not afraid to take on the media and tell him to, you know, go, you know, take a hike. Um, what about, what about Larry Hogan? <laughs> <laughs> what about him? <laughs> well, what hey, that's about- my governor. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> he might run as a third party candidate. Just for the record, Larry, I didn't laugh when everyone laughed at that suggestion. So there you have it. <laughs> I was going to end by saying, uh, you know, my governor in the state of Illinois, J.B. Pritzker, who who has also come in for his share of um, of criticism for the way that he's handled COVID and our vaccinations are a mess and we're like 44th or 45th in the country. Um, I think he thinks that he has aspirations and I think he has the checkbook to back it up. And I think Democrats will look favorably upon a candidate uh, in the future, perhaps. And I'm not sure, you know, we're, if we're looking four years out, eight years out, 12 years out, whatever it might be, um, but someone who has has the has the wherewithal, like the Michael Bloombergs or whoever, uh, to be able to, to you know, self-fund. So I think JB's got aspirations. I'm not sure they're going to be realized, though. That's what we need, another billionaire in the White House. Great. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's one of the great things about politics. It's always another one coming around the, the bend there. So um, I want to thank my guests, Tom Bevan, Carl Cannon, Molly Hemingway. And you can always find out more by going to realcleanerpolitics.com. Happy Valentine's Day. It's a good time to share a little peace, love, and understanding, especially with those with whom you may have a political difference. And so I urge you, as I always do, to 
Log on to Real Clear Politics. Read at least one piece from a uh, publication or a writer with whom you disagree. It's good mental uh, exercise. Thanks for listening. And until next time, for Real Clear Politics, I'm Andrew Walworth. And each time I feel like this inside, there's one thing I want to know. What's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? Oh, what's so funny about